coming up at some characteristically warm in parts of Europe this winter. C'est de l'herbe, même pas verdoyante, mais complètement jaunissante. Ski resorts come up with a plan to avoid going downhill. On est sur une troisième année de sécheresse dans les Pyrénées orientales. A new study identifies a startling degree of microscopic toxins in our food and water. I'm not sure many people knew that there were plastic particles in their bottled water in the first place. Nanoplastics in the environment, they are a problem, we can't get rid of them. And why were there so many climate disasters in 2023? A look back at the drivers of extreme weather. So dramatic and just so visible and it's what everyone is talking about. With scary predictions for the year ahead. What do you think happens in 2024? Does it get worse? That's a complicated question. This is just two degrees on TRT World. Governments that attended the COP28 climate summit in Dubai in December agreed to triple investments in renewable energy by the end of the decade. But there is consensus within the science community that Using wind and solar energy will do nothing to curb global warming on their own. Ultimately, oil and gas production and usage must come to an end. But how plausible is that? What are the challenges? We know that big oil knew for decades. Our climate is imploding faster than we can cope. From a product incompatible with human survival. Governments are overwhelmingly failing to stop the fossil fuel destruction. We are still subsidizing fossil fuels directly or indirectly. Fossil fuel phase out is inevitable. We are now in a transition. The beginning of the end for fossil fuel. 565 gigatons. That's humanity's carbon budget over the next four decades. How much CO2 we can safely release into the atmosphere and still have a chance to stay below two degrees Celsius of global warming. But the energy economy is built around easy and cheap fossil fuels, supplying about 80% of the world's energy. They are used for heating, transportation, and generating electricity, creating products like computers, cosmetics, paint, and household appliances. The task to phase out fossil fuels is therefore a difficult one. But there is a glimmer of hope. In its World Energy Outlook report for 2023, the International Energy Agency projects 95% of the new power capacity in 2024 will be from renewable resources. The IEA forecasts the share of renewable energy in global electricity generation could surpass coal this year, becoming the largest source of electricity and meeting one third of the global electrical supply for the first time. By 2030, they project it to grow to 50% of global electricity supply, and the share of fossil fuels in global energy will decline to 73% by 2030. The body says the rapid expansion of clean energy, electric cars, and heat pumps means that energy-related CO2 emissions could peak by 2025. But the majority of the world still receives its primary form of energy from coal, oil, and gas. And in 2023, the global carbon budget reached a record-breaking 40 billion tons. Climate scientists say we need to leave at least 80% of coal, oil, and gas reserves underground. A whopping 2,795 gigatons is the amount of carbon in reserves that the fossil fuel companies say they plan to burn. Environmental groups warn if they are dug up and burned, it would enter the world into a dystopia of climate science fiction, risking a rise in sea levels not seen in human history. Species extinction, droughts, superstorms, heat waves from hell, coral kill-offs, and consequences we cannot bear yet to imagine. It's likely no matter where in the world you are, you experienced at least one climate disaster or threat in 2023. For example, parts of Africa, Europe, and South America suffered some of the warmest temperatures, with 2023 confirmed as the hottest year, possibly in the last 100,000 years. Well, scientists also informed us of unprecedented sea ice loss in the Antarctic region. Carbon dioxide and methane emissions also hit record highs.
Well, the Copernicus Climate Change Service is a European Union funded organization that says it provides reliable access to high quality climate data, which could be used to help governments effectively tackle global warming and meet their sustainability goals. Samantha Burgess is the company's deputy director. A lot of the Copernicus Climate Highlights report talks about global heat in 2023 and the cascading effects. Uh, I guess it's important to note that uh, El Nino is a main factor. Is that a fair thing to say? Major probably not. El Nino definitely plays a role, but it is probably a minor role in the global temperature records of 2023. So when we look at the positive impact El Nino has, is about 0.1 degree uh, Celsius or 0.1 degree Kelvin per event. Um, it, and the transition that we've had over the recent years, we've had a triple dip La Nina, which has a cooling effect on our climate. So uh, for example, 2022, the previous, war, uh, previous year was the fifth warmest year on record, I believe. Um, so we've gone from fifth to first, and a part of that is the transition from La Nina to El Nino. A bigger part of it is um, the ocean heat content. Um, so we uh, had record sea surface temperatures around the global oceans from April through to December. And then, of course, greenhouse gas concentrations also play a major role. So you're saying that El Nino was not that much responsible for the heating in 2023. But then what happens when El Nino goes away? There's nothing much change. So when a El Nino uh, event ends, we are likely to either transition to a neutral phase. Uh, so there will be um, global warming associated with the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, there are some other natural variability elements, um, such as the solar cycle, volcanic eruptions, um, air quality, changes in air quality and cloudiness, um, so reflectiveness of the planet surface. Um, but all of these things combined play a role. And at the moment, we've not done the analysis of the proportional responsibility of, of each individual um, attribution. What we do know, looking at our data, is 2023 was um, the, the biggest proportional increase in heat in 2023 was from the tropical oceans, but not just the Pacific where the El Nino started and from Northern Hemisphere land. So that large proportion of additional heat from Northern Hemisphere land isn't associated with the El Nino because it was too early in the El Nino event. Mm. Well, that said, a lot of the heat in 2023 caused major climate disasters, uh, particularly for the developing world. We saw massive storms in Vanuatu, Peru and Malawi, deadly floods in Chile and Haiti, and droughts not just in places like the African continent, but Europe too, as we did in Spain. What do you think happens in 2024? Does it get worse? That's a complicated question. So we know there's a direct correlation between the global average temperature and the frequency and intensity of extreme events. So in a warmer world, we have more and worse extreme events. And that's what we saw in 2023. Some of the ones you mentioned, uh, so we had a um, more active than usual hurricane season or cyclone season, depending on which ocean basin you are, more heat waves, more drought events. And it, and it really changes um, the length and intensity of these events as well. And we know in a warmer world, they will get worse. However, they're very hard to predict ahead of time. So we know within 2024 we'll have heat waves, but we don't know where and when they will occur. We also know, looking at the numbers for the start of the year, the start of 2024 is going to be warm. That's in part to the ocean heat content and it's in part due to the El Nino. So we're starting the year much warmer than we started 2023, which is usual for the second year of an El Nino event. It depends how long this event lasts. At the moment, it looks like we'll transition out of it within a few months, and then we need to monitor the climate and understand how the rest of the year will evolve as to how warm 2024 will end up. In 2017, the UN reported that there were many times more microplastics in our oceans than there are stars in our galaxy. But scientists say there's potentially an even bigger problem, one that's too small to be seen. 
fake microplastics up to five millimeters in diameter now contaminate the world. In air currents, in raindrops, in sea salt, fish, and in our bodies, they're linked to weight gain, decreased reproductive health, and more. The microplastics and nanoplastics we are exposed to, we inhale and we ingest, that actually, you know, they, they, there's too much, so much plastic that it can even can enter our bloodstream. And while their effects are still being studied, hundreds of trillions of microplastic particles already pollute the environment. But even more mysterious and smaller than a micrometer are nanoplastics. These have already been found at the North and South Poles. Like microplastics, they come from every kind of plastic there is. And most nanoplastics are formed in the environment when larger pieces of plastic break down but their origin is still being debated, as they're harder to study because they're smaller. It's hard to detect and identify them, and the way they form has only been witnessed under lab conditions. And lab conditions don't show how they work in the wild. How toxic are they? Still unknown. There's not even a reliable way to measure how many there are. But scientists say they could be small enough to cross the protective barrier from our blood into our brains, and may even enter our cells. They've been shown to have harmful impacts on marine life, including changes in growth, developmental delays, and changes at the subcellular or smaller than cellular level. Like microplastics, there's no effective way to clean them up. Amid so many unknowns, their size makes them more abundant and perhaps more dangerous. Meanwhile, scientists have discovered that a liter of bottled water could contain about 240,000 plastic particles from seven types of plastics, both micro and nano. The figure represents 10 to 100 times more plastic in bottled water than previously thought. Well, Simon Boxall is senior lecturer at Ocean and Earth Science. He joins us now. Mr. Boxall, I am, I, this is a scary report we just heard. Firstly, I'm not sure many people knew that there were, there were plastic particles in their bottled water in the first place. I think there are two questions here. The first question which we just looked at was the question of nanoparticles in the marine environment. And there's no doubt we do see microplastics, nanoparticles in the marine environment. And that's to be expected. The large plastic particles break down, they become microplastics and then eventually nanoplastics. And we do know this enters the food chain and can enter the human food chain. However, the question you just posed is microplastics in bottled water. And that's a completely different thing. And this has been known about for a long time. And it's probably not surprising that we get plastic particles in dare I say, a bottle made of plastic. And when these are analysed, quite often it's very clear that the source of those plastics comes from the bottling process itself. Um, there's no evidence that we're getting nanoplastics in, say, bottles uh, of glass uh, water or uh, water coming through our taps. So, you know, that these are two questions. And the first question is nanoplastics in the environment they are a problem, we can't get rid of them, and they can absorb toxins. The second question about increased particles in our bottled water, we shouldn't be surprised. You know, we, we're, we're producing the water in plastic bottles, and that process means you're going to get particles of plastic in the water. Mm. And we understand there are studies being done to understand um, how toxic this can or, or may not be for human beings, but are you at all concerned? Should we be concerned when we drink uh, water out of a plastic bottle? It's a difficult question. And I think that the concerns we have, particularly in the environment, are that the plastic particles can absorb toxins. Things like DDT, which have been banned for years, but are still out there in the oceans, and they can be absorbed by the plastic particles. Now, in theory, and I'm not a medic, I cannot say medically this is true, but in theory, if the plastic particles in our bottled water are coming from the bottling process itself, then those plastic particles haven't had the opportunity to interact with other chemicals in the environment. Mm. So in terms of toxicity, plastic itself isn't in theory toxic. Now in terms of it crossing membranes, in terms of it entering our bloodstream, it's very difficult to say. Um, mm. 
And I think the jury is still out on that question. But in the meantime, you know, we, we shouldn't necessarily stop drinking water from plastic bottles, although to save plastic waste, then we should be using reusable bottles, maybe in glass or in um, uh, metal. You mentioned a while in your previous response that it's been known for a while that there are plastic particles in our plastic water bottles. Um, I guess that suggests that there's absolutely no way to get rid of them. Well, <laughs> th th these are two questions. I emphasize the stuff in the water bottles is entering the water bottles in the process of the bottling plant. Um, it's not a question of the sort of mineral waters that are being put into the bottles contain plastics per se. And so these are two different things. You know, if we were to look at plastic particles, say, in water that's bottled in glass, we don't see that same sort of level. And I think this is the thing. It's a question of, by definition, we're seeing plastics from plastic bottles becoming part of the the water in the bottle. I mean, it's it's kind of like uh, logic when you think about it. Mr. Boxer, when I was younger, it might have been a consequence of, of, of poverty at the time, but my mom would always boil water from the tap for us to drink. She would put it in the fridge yeah. for it to get cool. Uh, would you suggest we go back to doing this? No, that won't affect the plastics at all. Um, the boiling of the water gets rid of uh, bacteria, gets rid of um, um, various bugs that sometimes occur in water. And so it's sensible if you're not sure of how clean that water is. It'll have no effect on plastic particles. Um, if anything, boiling the water will tend to concentrate any particles that are in the water already. You're evaporating some of the water off, and so you'll find that per litre of water, boiling it will increase the plastic particles, not decrease them. It's only really boiling to get rid of any um, pathogens um, that are in the water. Hmm. Do you, would you recommend there is any way for us to protect ourselves uh, from these uh, plastic particles? But it, I know it sounds quite impossible at this point. Um, okay, again, we're coming back to two things. There's the environmental plastics, and there's no way we can actually protect ourselves against that. Um, then there's the bottled water plastics. We don't know whether that has an effect on us yet. I mean, the fact that reports are saying that there are an increased number of plastic particles in plastic bottled water is not surprising. The question really is, is it causing harm? And I guess the way you avoid it is you switch from using plastic bottles. And that, I guess, also helps the environment in terms of plastic in the environment. So in some ways, you could argue it's a win-win. Mr. Boxall, really great connecting with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Well, volunteers from the Spanish organization Ecologists in Action are on a mission to remove microplastic pellets that washed up on the shores of Spain's Galicia region last month. It is a time-consuming, meticulous process with the self-managed cleanup crew removing these small pellets by relying mostly on household tools. Pues estamos recogiendo los peles, todo con instrumentos de casa. Eh, quedamos a través de un grupo de Google Drive, no que se ponía, bueno, hay diversas playas entre todo Galicia. Eh, Eso, recogiendo los peles con las herramientas que tenemos nosotros mismos. Pues eh, estamos intentando limpiar las playas de un vertido de pellets que se produció hace casi un mes. Eh, esto es una tarea de limpieza completamente autogestionada por parte de voluntarios y e voluntarias de la zona. Son muy minuciosos, son muy laboriosos, se necesita mucha mano de obra, mucho tiempo para retirar cantidades muy pequeñas. Los oficiales, eh, desconocemos cualquier cifra de la administración, pero si, si lo que ha llegado es solo la punta de iceberg y, 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 y está en camino eh, dos o tres oleadas más de, de, de sacos de peles y estos no se retiran en el mar y también rompen en la, en la arena, en las rocas y se esparcen todas estas bolas, pues quizás podemos estar hablando de un, de un desastre de una magnitud eh, muy alta. ¿no? Bueno, estas bolitas eh, flotan en el agua y son confundidas por los peces con, con huevas de, de, de otro pez, y entonces eh, son confundidas con alimento, con lo cual los peces se ingieren esta, estas bolitas y esto pues queda en la, en la cadena trófica. The Norwegian government has greenlit a proposal for deep sea mining, which effectively will speed up the exploration of minerals and precious metals in the country's waters. The mining companies will be able to apply for licenses in an area larger than Britain to look for lithium, scandium, and cobalt. 
Oslo passed the proposal despite warnings from scientists that it could have a devastating impact on marine life. The area is uh, in the Arctic. It is one of the areas that are feeling climate change the strongest. It's also uh, very unexplored and we have uh, far too little knowledge about the ecosystems that will be affected by deep sea mining. Yes, we are very worried that Norway chooses this time to, to send the signal uh, that they will push forward deep sea mining when the rest of the world are, are discussing a moratorium or a precautionary pause on, um, uh, on this industry. Um, so, of course, when, when I as an origin see my own government disregarding science, while I hear that Norway is, is positioning itself as an ocean leader globally, I'm worried that people are going to listen to Norwegian politicians and their greenwashing agenda. Norway seems to have this idea that deep sea mining will uh, become uh, the solution for the green transition, which is a really odd uh, uh, idea. I mean, uh, what we see internationally is more and more countries are moving away from deep sea mining, saying no, um, and asking for the precautionary principle to uh, to guide us in this question. While Norway seems to be looking to the oil industry and the extractive industries that we are already relying on, destroying both the climate and now also the nature. Well, Europe's ski resorts are feeling the heat. More than 90% of them could eventually face critical shortages of natural snow, according to scientists. It's already beginning to play out in France, where some ski resorts have closed down altogether. Now, in the name of survival, three of them have joined forces to develop year-round activities. As the earth warms, the winter sports industry is coming face-to-face -face with its own mortality, lack of precipitation, and a severe winter heat wave in the 2022-2023 season left usually snow-covered mountains bare. C'est de l'herbe, même pas verdoyante, mais complètement jaunissante, puisque euh, on est sur une troisième année de sécheresse dans les Pyrénées orientales, et on, on est dans le début d'une d'une deuxième d'un deuxième hiver avec une sécheresse hivernale, quoi. Some ski resorts in France have been forced to shut down permanently, but three small establishments in the French Catalan Pyrenees mountains are looking ahead instead, banking on a post-snow environment. Donc maintenant, on va aussi se rapprocher et créer des centres de profit, tels que des restaurants, peut-être des boutiques. Et, euh, et donc, sur l'activité hiver, on, on diversifie de cette manière-là. Euh, C'est des investissements qui peuvent fonctionner été comme hiver, avec ou sans neige. Et on les a fait justement dans des endroits où, euh, à l'horizon, comme je le disais, à l'horizon 2050, on a une assurance neige qui est beaucoup plus marquée. The scheme is under fire from local authorities and environmentalists. The project includes the construction of a chairlift to take punters up to 2,500 meters above sea level just to reach the natural snow. And the Regional Chamber of Accounts says public money is not actually being spent on long-term solutions. Les investissements qui sont prévus pour sécuriser l'économie du ski sont non pérennes, relèvent euh, d'un projet anachronique Et on a beau proclamer partout qu'on veut faire du quatre saisons, l'essentiel de l'argent public qui est fléché sur ce dispositif concerne en fait une amélioration, une modernisation ou un renouvellement euh, des euh, installations destinées au ski alpin. One solution to the skiing crisis has been artificial snow. Between 2005 and 2016, 20% of ski resort spending in France went towards generating snow. Snow production involves projecting micro droplets of water into the atmosphere so that they freeze before falling to the ground. But for that to work, it still has to be very, very cold. And it also requires plenty of water, around 5 million liters a day. That means heat waves and drought effectively rule out man-made snow as a solution. So environmentalists say snow sports simply aren't sustainable in this mountain range, and that governments and businesses need to start looking at life après ski. And that's our show, but before I leave you, days of heavy rains and flooding left people in central Peru with water up to their knees. The Defense Minister Jorge Chavez said the downpours came in advance of El Nino and are not related to the weather phenomenon. Close to 400 districts were at risk of landslides, endangering over a million people.
se ha atracado. Y ha venido el caterpillar, ha querido sacar, se rompía la soja. En uno de esos vino el huayco, se lo llevó y a mis dos hijas también. El otro amigo está en la merced, mis cosas están aquí.